Good afternoon, my name is Taylor Bowie. We're at the Seattle Center at the 2012 Seattle Antiquarian Book Fair. Uh, it's Sunday, October 14th, and I'm sitting here with Lewis Collins, who not only is a long-time, well-established, well-known, and highly regarded bookseller, but is also the extremely capable director of this great, great regional fair. I told you not to make me laugh. Thank you, <laughs> Lewis, for that, for all your hard work on the book fair. It would not, not only would not be the same without you, it wouldn't be anything without you, so thank you for that. So we're just going to start out with a little bit about your background. Tell us where you were born, where you grew up. Like August 2nd, 1940, Baltimore, Maryland. My first memory was Pearl Harbor. Wow. When I was a little kid, when I was about four or five years old, I was telling my parents about a, an event I realized that I'd been carried out and I was held by them and it was, everybody was tense in this neighborhood of row houses. And they scratched their heads and they thought back and everything and they said, the only time that ever happened that we took you out into the street and everybody was upset was Pearl Harbor Day. So wow. I figured my first memory was Pearl Harbor Day. So you were what, like year old. Barely. Yeah, Barely. Fourteen year old. months yeah. old. Yeah, yeah, right. like yeah, that. yeah. Well that's, yeah. that's remarkable. Yeah. Well I have to ask now, what's your next oldest memory? <laughs> <laughs> that's great. No, we won't talk about that. Okay, all right. Well, we'll leave that to people's <laughs> right, imagination. Yeah. Baltimore. But Baltimore, yeah. Baltimore when I was uh, about 15, 16 years old, I started going into downtown Baltimore, mm -hmm. hanging around, looking for, at that time, beatnik coffee shops, which was the thing. Mm -hmm. And I saw my first secondhand used bookstore. And now, I, you were in high school? I was in there. high school at the time. Okay. And I went in and I saw this guy in a tweed jacket with leather patches and a beard and smoking a pipe and he was playing chess with some crony. <laughs> And every once in a while selling a book from these stacks. Do you remember, remember the name of the shop or the name of the proprietor? I don't remember the shop, but the shop was right on Howard Street, right by these Harris Auction Galleries, which is oh, yeah. a major, major. You know, auction gallery. Yeah. And this is where bookstores are still in that kind of bookstore row. Uh -huh. But I don't specifically remember the name of the, that one. Not to get or the track. bearded guy. But are know, there so. still, is there still a little bookseller? Well, the in woman, Baltimore? what's her name? Uh, Fram? No, no, the... Uh, the children's books, uh, Yol not Yolanda, some name like that. It was a woman with children's books, Drusilla's. Drusilla's oh, books uh -huh. was right in that same okay. book, you know, a few yeah. years ago. I haven't been back for yeah. a while. Yeah. But I really knew then exactly what I wanted to do. At age 15 or 16? 15 or 16, yeah. I saw that and I really loved old books and I've been, you know, addicted to the dust ever since. Watching this nameless fellow who had this bookshop, yeah. was that what you anticipated? Your book selling would be oh, yeah, sitting yeah. in a tweed jacket yeah, with yeah. a beard, smoking, smoking a pie, playing chess, playing chess, and occasionally selling a book. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Just thought that was good. Except I hate pipes, and I never learned how to play chess. And I've never seen you wearing a jacket <laughs> with patches on. Well, the I got them. I got them. Oh, you did all. All right. Well, I don't, don't, don't want to see it. Though. Right. Uh, well, what uh, what happened then? I mean, you what happened then is yes. I opened up the beatnik coffee shop called the Zen Den in Baltimore At when I was 18 age? years when you were old. 18. So my entrepreneurial 18 nature, years old and you started your own business. It's called the Zen Den, which was a very popular beatnik coffee shop. Uh -huh. Mostly because at some point I opened this place up and there was no music in it. You know, it's so somebody came in with a portable little, you know, LP player, right. and that didn't work, but then one day this big, huge, burly black man came in and he said, I hear you want some music in here. So I said, oh yeah, that'd be interesting, what do you play? Conga drums. So for about six months we had these two guys playing four conga drums, and it became the hottest thing in town, and we charged admission to get in. It had cost a dollar to get into the place. And it was full all the time from like Thursday, Thursday to Sunday or something. Did you make espresso? Espresso, drinks? but in a Chemex pot. We didn't have a machine, you well, know. But what, we had, would, what would I have had to pay for an espresso? Dollar for just a coffee, and you know, a dollar and a quarter for a cappuccino, and a dollar admission. Well, that wasn't exactly cheap. Made a lot of money. Yeah. Bought a little Nash Rambler, you know, kind of thing to drive around. And even there. I take it you quit school by then. I was out of school. This is 18. I was finished yeah. school. But I never, no, no, well, further education, I ended up, I ended up 
leaving Baltimore to New York and looking for jobs in bookstores. Uh -huh. So I looked and applied for work at every bookstore in Let's New York. Let's not get ahead. I mean, yeah. what happened to the coffee shop? It lasted a year. Oh, a year. Was, yeah. What yeah. made you close it? Uh, tried to sell it to these people and they ended up taking the drummers and opening another place. And, and so then it was like useless and time to get out. It was finished, you know, anyway. Did you so, save any money from it? No, no, we spent all the money. Oh. All the money was spent almost, you know, that week. Because after the place closed on like four o'clock in the morning, we closed the coffee shop. And whoever was around, we would go to a place and buy everybody breakfast. <laughs> And where we usually went to buy the breakfast was this uh, Jewish delicatessen, which is what the diner is all about. Because oh, Barry Levinson, yeah. his he was like his older brother was part of this whole generation really? crowd. So you're saying that Levinson was inspired by this? Well, no, the diner was where all these people hung oh, out. Just generally, so we, yeah, out. yeah, yeah, wow. And the one that is, I think, personally ex ex uh, inspiration for that movie is when. Mickey Rourke and the other guy are driving. It's in you know like daytime, and they see the woman on the horse and all that. And they've been driving around all night, actually. And he says, "What well, do you think we should call it a night?" You know. Like, <laughs> yeah. So we would do that. Like we'd go to breakfast, and then we'd drive to Pennsylvania, or we'd drive to Virginia, or something. And we'd have four people in this car, you know, yakking all night, you know, talking philosophy or music or something like that. And, and that, I think, very specifically was because uh, you know, some of the yeah, people that he I was see. close to yeah. were in that car. Okay. So, so anyway, yeah. one year in the in the coffee shop, and then you headed to New York. I got to New York. I was in New York and like, looked for bookstore jobs. Got a job in a coffee shop. Where? What neighborhood was the coffee shop in? I worked at the Cafe Figaro, and then I worked at the Cafe Finjan. Where are those? Where are those? British Village. Oh, okay. Yeah, Cafe Figaro is a famous one. Still Laker and McDougal. It's been different things, and I think it's reopened again yeah. as the Cafe Figaro. So we're talking about 1959? 60. 60, 61, 60, 63. Okay. Where were you living in New York? $55 a month apartment. In, in, down in the village? In the village, yeah. Mm -hmm. I never left 14th Street like you did in those days. You never went above 14th Street. Oh, I, see. I, I never go below yeah. about... I served coffee to Bob Dylan. Wow. And Warren Beatty and really? whoever he was, Natalie Wood and Warren Beatty, yeah. I think were a couple then. Wow. And they used to come from the you know like actors' workshop and have coffee in the coffee shop. I rarely go below about 57th Street. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. you know, it's yeah. different worlds. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. What were you doing anything with books during that? Always, time? always, always. Well, yeah. tell us what. I was always uh, accumulating books. I accumulated books in Baltimore. You know, when I left Baltimore, I left a small library of things uh, like. Modern Library editions, uh -huh. which somehow or another I always liked if something was in a series. Yeah, to me too. Complete it, so I had a shelf of Modern Library stuff or something. Penguins in Modern Library I was interested in. But were you doing any actual no. books no. out buying and No, I was buying for myself. Right. But in New York, in New York was the first time when I commoditized mm -hmm. books. So I would go into, you know, say, uh, Gold, is a Goldwater's place, a University place. And I'd buy something. University Place books? Yeah, it was gold. I think gold. I can't Walter remember. Gold, Walter Gold. Walter Gold. Mm -hmm. Walter Gold. Gold Water. Gold Water. Gold Water. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. And he complimented me on scouting once, really? you know, for getting a really good book from the stacks, you know, oh, and nice. I went to buy it and yeah. he thought that was interesting. Did you know you got a good eye. Uh, no. She, he she was had just her own him. bookshop, Eleanor Lowenfield. Yeah, she yeah. had a corner bookshop in New York. Maybe, Eleanor. but you know, I was yeah. at that Fourth Avenue when yeah. it was full strand and yeah. all that was full of stuff. Wow. But I would get something and go and trade it. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd get something I didn't want that was a buck and go and get trade, you know, ten dollars worth of trade mm -hmm. for the ten dollar book I wanted. Yeah. And so I was commoditizing books. Sure. Well, that's, that's a way to get into the trade, yeah, I'd yeah. say. And I remember the first book I bought to what sell for that? cash. Too. What was that? I, in Berkeley, I bought a copy of uh, Philip Lamantia's Erotic Poems for a buck in a store on University Avenue. Mm -hmm. And I had it, and I was going to take it to Serendipity the next day to sell it to Peter Hell. Mm -hmm. But I ran into Alan Cavici at Moe's Bookstore. So he bought it from me for $60. Oh, that much. And then I told Peter I had it, not knowing their animosities, you know, and then so all of a sudden he was furious that I sold that book to the Kavichi. He would have paid me hundreds of them. When I was first in yeah. business, 
I hadn't been to Biz more than a few months. I had a copy of Wallace Thurman's The Black or the Berry, you know, like a VG jacket, which I sold to Alan Kobichi for $10. Mm -hmm. So that was... That was yeah. <laughs> well, let's get back to New York yes. uh, for a Still while. Still in New York. Yeah. Uh, did you left New York without Co having gone into the book trade? No, second? yeah, no, I couldn't. I never f was able to get a job, uh -huh. store, but in coffee shop. So what, what then uh, made you decide? Well, I became San involved with this uh, French woman who had been in New York for a while and was planning to go back to France. And I was planning to go back to France. Most of my friends in New York were French people and movie-related people. You were planning to go back to France? I was going, well, and she was going back to France, and they were going back to okay. France, and I was planning to go to, go to France. France okay. yeah. But anyway, in those days, it was the Yugoslav freighter. You take the Yugoslav freighter to Tangiers. New York to Tangiers took about six days. It cost 50 some dollars or something like that, and you had a berth, and you had food, and, and uh, it was the cheapest way to get to Europe. And then you'd be able to ferry or hitchhike, get some to Spain and go on. And so, well, she wanted to see Mexico before she went back to France. So I found out that the Yugoslav freighter left Veracruz as well. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, let's get through Mexico to Veracruz, then we'll go back to Tangiers from Veracruz. But ended up getting out to, to uh, L.A. And in L.A., I, you know, I got kind of bogged down, met people that were in the community college system and stuff. And it was like free tuition, all you had to do was pay books. Anybody could go in, you took tests and placement and stuff like that. This is what, 1962? This would be 64. 64. Left New York New Year's of 64. You know, got, you know, January sometime, we're in L.A. Yeah. Decided to actually stay and go to school because I never had the right SATs or right. money or right. whatever to do school in back east. And what did the woman do? Well, she decided to stay with me. Oh. And, you know, so we went, instead of trying to be in L.A., which I didn't want to do, we went to San Francisco. So I got to San Francisco, got jobs. Had you been there Never before? books, never been there before, just knew about it. Yeah. Uh, well, applied for every bookstore in San Francisco. Never got a job. Give us some names Never of some of the shops you applied at. Well, in, in Hollywood, I went to every store in Hollywood. You know, all the stuff on Hollywood Boulevard, all the guys downtown. And I don't remember all of the names. Cherokee. Yeah, Cherokee like for that. sure, yeah. I don't think Heritage wasn't there yet. I mean, even Hollywood Book City wasn't there yet. That stuff was not there yet. But I think Heritage was on Hollywood Boulevard at the time. Well, I, there was a book city before they became heritage or something. I was like, well, they yeah. were related, you know, cousins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but no work. I couldn't get work. Dawson's, you checked it out. I went all of the, every store, every store, including the new bookstores. I'd sure. go to new bookstores, too. I just went. was so never able to get a job. But I, I met a printer nearby where I was staying, this guy whose name was Bob Alexander, and he had a press of small press poetry called Press Baza, and he did you know, small press poetry and stuff. And he, he, I was thinking of even becoming a printer, apprenticing and becoming a printer. Mm -hmm. I liked that better than the jobs I had in restaurants and cafes and stuff. So, but he suggested I go and talk to David Meltzer, a friend and a poet who worked for Discovery Bookstore right. in North Beach, San Francisco. Now, you did have sort of jobs of one sort or another. I was always working. Right restaurant yeah, jobs. Mostly restaurant, mostly food, food restaurant right. jobs. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Coffee. Yeah, I, I was always able to just get a job in a restaurant, you know, yeah. chef, coffee man, sandwich chef. guy, you know. What kind of a chef? chef? You know, short order cook. Like you, you, that really? What, where did you do that? What? Any number of, you know, googie restaurants in L.A. Oh, in L.A. You know, and then wow. in North Beach, in San Francisco, I got a job in like the Hofbrow on uh -huh. Broadway, and I was in a taco place in the Mission District, you know. Well, so your cooking skills, which I've enjoyed on a number of occasions, I, I, you've got a background mm, in it. Somewhat, yeah. You, know, you learned how to do it right. Well, I know how to slice the piece of roast beef. No, yeah. no, you're better than that. But that's. I do day. know how to make taco meat. Really? Which you don't want to learn. No, no. no let's 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 move on right. from that. So yeah, I get the I get the introduction to David Meltzer, and I get to L.A. Uh, to San Francisco, San Francisco, which is you know in like April of '64, and mm -hmm. I go in, I introduce myself, Bob Alexander's friend, Dave is very. Per Pleasant. Uh -huh. He introduces me to Fred Roscoe, the owner of the place, you know, who's very pleasant, you know, and says, Oh yeah, next job next opening I'll give you a job. Uh -huh. 
So, you know, the next six months go by and there's somebody new working there, it's not me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, nice. I figure I'm never going to work in, uh, you know, a bookstore. Right. But then one day I'm in the Cafe Trieste normally and the guy that, one of the guys that works at this Discovery says, you still want to work for that? Da 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 da. And I said, well, I still want to work in the bookstore. He says, well, we're claw quitting today. So Saturday morning, you know, trying to keep a straight face, I walked into Discovery. Now, did it not pique your curiosity why everybody? Oh, I knew. I I knew. Why were they? Because he was a da 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 da. He was. Yeah, yeah. Even though he was pleasant when he first spoke to you. Well, pleasant, yes. Yeah, saying I'll give you the next job, yeah. which didn't happen. But you know, he had a terrible temper, and he was sort of a, anyway. But I got the job. He's you know, I came in there and I, was, you got any work, Fred? And he's, and he told me later he would never have hired me because from when I introduced myself to when the next opening was up, I'd already brought in books to trade. I'd already bought books. So he says he's never going to hire me because it was like losing a customer. Oh, for God's sake. But anyway, so anyway, but I worked there. I was his longest employee because I worked there even after I started my own business. I stayed working for him until well, 81. What were your uh, duties and responsibilities? Clerking, you know, buying and selling at night. I worked from six to midnight, four days a week, for a long time. And I bought books over the counter, and I sold books and shelved and stuff. Yeah. And then somewhere along the line, though, before you quit there, you started your own. Yeah. Business. Well, I started right away quoting books. Right. I had already, you know, I got A.B. Bookman's Weekly. Sure. I got the Library Bookseller. I got Black, uh, not Blackwell's, but you know, I got a lot of wantless. So I started yeah. quoting books. And the reason I became legitimate and got a resale number in 69 is because I had offered books to the San Francisco Public Library. And they demanded it. They, I had to have a resale number right. for them to do it. So I went down, I got a resale number. So in 1969, you know, my legitimate birth. But legitimate. I'd already sold erotic poems for a buck. Uh -huh. I mean, from a buck to 60 bucks. And yeah. then started just buy and sell books. Yeah. You know, quoting books. Book searching, because I have this gift, the only gift I have is that somebody comes and asks me in the bookstore where I'm working, do you have such and such? And I, either I go right over to the section and pull it out and give it to them, or my brain says, hmm, that is over at Holmes Bookstore in the psychology section, da 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 da. Third I see it. Yeah. Yeah. And I did this, one of the best stories I think about the skill is that reading the A.B. Bookman, doing the list, you know, I'm reading Holmes full page want list for something, and I'm going down and I click on this book, and oh, I no. saw that book at Holmes. Yeah, I knew you were going to say yeah. that. Somehow. So I didn't call them and tell them that they had the book in their psychology section. I sent them a postcard, I quoted it to them. And so they send me a check. Oh. Then I go over, next time I go over to Holmes, I go in, I go to the psychology section. I, Book's still there, luckily enough. I pull it, I take it up to the counter, buy it, erase the price, stick my invoice in it, and deliver it to the rare book room upstairs. But I, I pretty much <laughs> sit, I would sit, you know, either in my house or in the coffee shop or in the bookstore, and I, I had a vision of all the books in the Bay Area. You know, when I got a car, I had a <laughs> vision of the books, you know, in a lot more bookstores than, you know, went by bus and stuff. And I made money. From then, I was making money supplying books to people that asked me to find a book for them, which led for 35 years as a pleasant business, three months out of the year on the road, you know, working when, very little. When you got your uh, resale number in 69, when did you start making road trips and scouting trips outside the Bay Area looking for books? For example, well, even, you when know, did you first come up to Seattle? 71. 71. Did you? With Gerald Webb. He had to pick up some books in Vancouver at an auction that he had won. So he grabbed me and we got a little Volkswagen we drove on up and stopped in various places. Do you remember any of the shops you visited? Sure, he was the main shop. Uh -huh. That's what he wanted to see. And then we rushed to Vancouver to get these Chinese chinois paintings or something like that. And then back. But basically it was just short, it was quick. <coughs> Excuse me. But I bought a car the next year, so 72, uh -huh. I drove up here with my son in a Volkswagen Squareback and went to all the stores, meeting 
Robert Matilla meeting David Ishii, and especially later in the afternoon, I ended up in the university district and met Russ. Did you recall meeting me that first time? No. Day? I don't no, think you no, did. No, I don't no. remember you coming into David Ishii's. Well, I was in David Ishii's, well, but you weren't there. Yeah, yeah right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was, that was right. one of my early book trade jobs. Uh, just personal interest. And I met Bill Hoffer. That oh. same trip in Vancouver. Oh, up in Vancouver. Yeah. yeah. So I go into I go and I'm looking into books in Vancouver, and I hear that there's a store just opening up now, north near UBC. Well, I go there, and here's Hoffer standing in the middle of the place, and the store had just had a fire overnight, and he's there all distraught and everything else like that. And I introduce myself, and we're talking and everything, and then I see a copy of the Penguin first original edition of three plays, I think it is, by J.P. Dunleavy. So I reach behind him into the mess and I pick it out and I buy a book from him in the middle of his fire damage. He's always remembered that. that was <laughs> yeah. so, but I met Preston McCann and McMahon, uh, McMahon and Bill Hoffer, Don Stewart, all on that first trip. You Ned, know? Ned Bowes. And Russ, and Ned Bowes, but you know, I'm talking about the ones I remembered well, you know, like, so basically, Press Mac, <laughs> yeah. Tick Mac, Russell, Russ Johansson, and uh, Don Stewart, and Bill Hoffer. <clears throat> and continued every year since then, every year then, I was up here doing a book scouting trip. So I'm gathering that you and I probably first met in either maybe 76 or After you bought yeah. Norris. After I took yeah. over the yeah. Hoffenberg yeah. operation. Yeah. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. 35 years. Uh, in 1981, did I understand right, that's when you stopped working at Discovery? They closed, yeah. Oh, they closed. I was always, what happened is that I, I quit to do my business, mm -hmm. which, you know, I was doing book search out of his story, didn't mind that and all that, but I quit. Anyway, I was going to do my business full time, uh -huh. <laughs> cataloging in the book search and traveling. And, but um, you quit close to the time they closed anyway. No, 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 no. Oh. This was no. This was seventy two, seventy three. Oh, I misunderstood. No, he just wouldn't take my key back. He said keep oh. the key because oh. you live right around the corner oh, at see. that time. And so I always was either relief, okay. vacation. So you were, you were no longer full time. Starting. No, but I worked there yeah. every month probably for bit. that period. Of time. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Always had a key. Always worked at the yeah. place yeah. Yeah. until they closed in eighty one, yeah. which was to me a horrible <laughs> end of an era. <laughs> So, Where were you living at the time, 1981? Uh, in 81, well, 81 was, uh, uh, 81, no, 81 was the law, uh, 72, we, Sue, my wife and I bought the building on Petrero Hill. Uh, Carolina, which was, yeah, which was the main reason to quit the bookstore, because I was full-time and I had a bookstore. Right. So, but anyway, like I say, he... I, I don't remember. Keep was, was that an open shop, sort of? Yeah. Well, you know, no hours. It's, yeah. I always, always have been chance for appointment. Right. I've never had a shop where it's like on the, a walk-in yeah, browsing good. thing. Yeah. That's it's good. It's always been shop chance for appointment. Now I'm just thinking ahead. You were on Carolina. Can't remember how long, but then after that you relocated the, to. Well, uh, the the missions. The divorce. Oh yeah. And having to sell the house, I found luckily enough, I found the loft I could live in the back of. Uh -huh. So then that mission loft got developed. Yeah. Well, and I could have bought that floor, but I didn't want to buy the floor. So. What year was that? You moved from Carolina? 80s. 19, 1980, you know, I moved out of that to Mission Street. Really? Yeah. No. I got that a little, uh, little turned around. I thought I remember visiting you in 80. Well, I still, the building didn't get sold until 83. Oh, all right. Okay. And, but I was, I was out of it. She was out of it. We were renting it to the Sopwith Camel. Band, really? Yeah. So they were a good friend of mine. They did. They actually had these wonderful music. It, it wasn't the stop. It was the lead singer Peter Kramer, a friend of mine. Well, who so, did the famous record of "Hello"? That's hello, it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Hello, so hello. He was living in there, and then they had these wonderful sort of rent parties, which is you know music and stuff wow. in the bookstore space, with empty, no shut, no books yeah, on the shelf. Nice. Yeah. Wow. That's but crazy. I was still in San Francisco. It was before I moved up here. Yeah. This, this was bought in '84. Was able to get this in '84. So you've been in Seattle now for 28 years. Wow, longer really than you were in San Francisco. This is the longest I've ever been in one place. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm glad about that. So you always had, always had uh, a shop, but 
hours by chance or point. And all my business, I developed my business so I didn't have to have employees or hours. So it's always the, either book search shows catalog, something like that. Not sitting there trying to sell books right. to the public. Uh, anybody in the trade that, besides the people you've mentioned, that had any particular influence? Peter on Howard. Peter Howard. Sarah Maybe he's the only one. Yeah, I understand. Probably the only one that influenced me really. Right. And he and I were in the same high school. He's a year ahead of me in high school in Baltimore, Maryland. I don't want to put words in your mouth. <laughs> I don't want to put words in your mouth, but would yeah. you say that you, things you learned from Peter were both how to do some things and then also how not to do some things? Uh, less not to do, because the guy, the guy, I've always said to this guy that owned Discovery Bookshop, who had used to introduce me at some point, he says, I, he's a really good book man, I've taught him everything he knows. And so I would like nod, and yes you have, but negatively, you know, because yeah. everything I learned from him was what not to do. Yeah. But mostly what Peter, uh, mostly Peter taught me what to do, yeah. I think. Or just sent me in a direction, I don't think I listened to anybody particularly. Yeah. No, you were but just help me yeah. do my thing a little better. You know, so. What, right now, uh, you have an inventory of some size, most of it listed on the internet. Yep. Just give us a couple of minutes, we don't have a lot of time, yep. about your assessment of the effect of the internet on the used and rare book trade. Take it however well, you wish. Well, two ways. My business was completely destroyed. The internet wiped out my business in 98, 99, 2000. Everything I did for 35 years was wiped out You're by specifically the internet. speaking of book, book search. search finding books for people, right. traveling, looking right. for books right. for people. My value added disappeared immediately. Right. I had nothing, so I had to like reshift, do everything, and then I'm competing with the goodwill to sell books on the internet, simple as that. But the other aspect, and it's helping me just as well once I did that adjustment, is I would say between 1992, you know, when the internet first started, and 90-something when Amazon started to sell non-ISBN numbered books, the gross national product of used books has probably gone up a thousand times. The amount of used books being sold in this world now is huge oh, yeah. compared to the inefficient yeah. finding a book on the Oregon coast that right. somebody in New York wanted. All right. It's, Take it back to it's just a totally to efficient mm -hmm. business, fantastic, and huge, huge new money. Yeah. Gold rush. Gold rush. A gold yeah. rush. So it's in balance, would you say it's been a good thing? That sounds like Oh, I hate it. It's the most boring new change in the world, and any idiot can do it. Well, any idiot can get a book, look online, and sell it on Amazon. I'd argue that, but I guess <laughs> that's for another interview right, yeah, as well. Right, yeah. Now, you've been in the trade now for a long time. 43 years of when you got your uh, resale. resale. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a pretty long mm -hmm. stretch. Tell us a little bit about, I know you've hoped at times to retire. What's the status of that? I would retire out of the sitting in front of a computer, working as a glorified shipping clerk for Amazon. Mm -hmm. But I haven't figured out a way to do that. I don't have enough Social well, Security or retirement. Well, let, let us say that someone came along and bought your business. Oh, I'd, I'd go out with a suitcase. I'd be very happy. And well, what would you do? Would you stay involved with books in some way? I, I, always with books, yeah. but not okay. necessarily uh, trying to buy and sell. But okay. I would just, yeah, you know, I love books. Yeah. Something to do with books. Yeah, sure. I thought so. Well, and I'd easily go out of that place with a suitcase and my van maybe. Uh -huh. And I, I don't think it'd be too long I wouldn't have a whole shelf of books. <laughs> so. I, I, yeah, I, I can imagine that. Yeah, and interesting book. Yeah. Still, yeah. So. Yeah, well, I know you like to travel. And, uh, that was it. I'd like to travel. I know you like to move around. Well, we're very. And you can't travel in the business. Then. We are very grateful you've chosen to stay in Seattle for as long as you have, and I, I hope it's for another twenty-eight years at least. So. <laughs> Lewis, thank you very much. You're Been welcome. Fun, great talk. Future generation. God bless you. They'll be looking at us in fifty years. <laughs>